Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning and welcome to this event on UK and US IP enforcement views from the top. We are very fortunate to have with us today Mr. David Kappos, who is the Under Secretary of Commerce for the US Patent and Trademark Office, and Mr. John Alti, who is the Chief Executive and Comptroller General of the Intellectual Property Office for the United Kingdom. I thought I would just take about five minutes uh, to provide opening remarks, uh, framing the discussion this morning, uh, going through why intellectual <coughs> property uh, rights and enforcement are very important, and then I will turn it over uh, to the two colleagues to provide about 15 to 20 minutes of presentation and speech. As my colleague Robert Atkinson and I write in a forthcoming book in 2012, The Race for Global Innovation and Why the United States is Falling Behind, Nations around the world are engaged in an intense competition for a global innovation advantage. In that competition for global innovation advantage, countries increasingly compete based upon the strengths of their nation's innovation ecosystems. And assuredly, the strength of a country's intellectual property system is a basis of competition just as readily as countries' strengths in their science and technology policies, their education and tax policies are. This includes the ability of nations' IP systems to grant rights to innovators in a timely manner, to produce high quality patents, and to provide effective and efficient systems for IP enforcement. This has become increasingly critically important as a larger share of nations' economies and employment are based in intangible intellectual property IP intensive industries. Looking at the share of output accounted for by IP intensive industries in the United States, about 33.1% of the US economy is in IP intensive industries. 60% of US exports originate from IP intensive industries. 18 million Americans rely on employment for IP intensive firms. <laughs> are predicated upon IP-intensive products and services. It's easier for others, whether individuals, competing enterprises, or competing nations, to steal that intellectual property or to force its transfer to foreign countries as a condition of market access. For example, in 2009 alone, Chinese theft of U.S. intellectual property cost 1 million U.S. jobs and $48 billion in economic losses. Globally, every year, the cost of the global trading system of IP theft is from 500 to $600 billion, which represents about 5 to 7% of the value of world trade. Given how important it is to stop IP theft, we must have very strong systems domestically to counter foreign IP theft, but we also must partner amongst nations to improve the global intellectual property system and to work collaboratively on enforcement against those who would not respect others' intellectual property rights. Yet, unfortunately, economies that fail to offer and to enforce adequate intellectual property rights only hurt themselves and will ultimately fall short of their innovation potential. Now, I know there's been a long-running debate in the intellectual property community about whether IP rights help or harm developing nations. But as a new excellent report from the OECD uh, released just this year, called Policy Complements to the Strengthening of IPRS in Developing Countries Fines. They state that the evidence is conclusively clear that in developed and developing economies alike, IPR reforms lead to greater economic growth. In fact, what the study finds, looking at data from the Park Index of Patent Rights, 
going back to 1970 across 110 nations. The PARC index looks at how countries are able to strengthen their patent systems uh, through better enforcement, through greater coverage of the IP system, uh, lengthening the duration of IP terms. What they find, going back to 1970, is for every 1% increase in copyright protections in the developing nation, they experience a 6.8% increase in inward foreign direct investment, a 3.3% increase in domestic R&D activity, and their nation's exports increase. They find that similarly, 1% increases in patent rights and trademark rights also leads to the same effects of dynamically increasing inward FDI, R&D activity, and export growth. So it's critically important that developing nations place a focus on intellectual property rights as well. And of course, this holds for developed economies as well. As the Hargreaves Review of Intellectual Property in the UK finds, and which we'll hear more about this morning, if the recommendations in that report were to be implemented, uh, the UK expects an annual increase of, in GDP of about 0.3 to 0.6% every year. Of course, uh, this all starts with strong intellectual property uh, strengthening the IPR system at home. And in that regard, uh, there's been very good news in the United States in the past several months as we, in September, passed the American Invents Act by a vote of 95 to 5 in the Senate, uh, which shows that even in this town, and even now, both sides of the aisle can still come together to pass good policy that promotes the ability of America's inventors, enterprises, and the economy as a whole to innovate and to compete in the global economy. So with that, I would like to formally introduce John Alti, who will speak first, uh, and then David Kapos, who will speak secondly. Uh, so as I said, John is the Chief Executive and Comptroller General of the Intellectual Property Office in the United Kingdom. Mr. Alti assumed that post in February of 2010. He is a board-level civil servant, having begun his career with the UK Department of Trade and Industry in 1978. John spent several years as a Director of European Policy, and his last post was as Director General of the Fair Markets Group in the Department for Business, Innovation, and Skills. So he brings with him substantial EU and international experience. John is classically trained in Greek, Latin, and philosophy from the illustrious University of Oxford. David Kapos is Under Secretary of Commerce for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, a role he assumed in August of 2009. Before joining the USPTO, Mr. Kapos served as Vice President and Assistant General Counsel for Intellectual Property at IBM. David has served on numerous boards and other leadership roles in the intellectual property field and has written and spoken extensively on IP topics both in the United States and globally. Mr. Kapos received his Bachelor's of Science degree in Electrical and Computer Engineering from the University of California, Davis in 1983 and his law degree from Berkeley as well in 1990. In total, he has over 23 years of experience in the intellectual property field. Thank you both for joining us this morning. And John, may I ask you to go ahead and provide some remarks? The question that we're looking to answer is 
how do we create, best create the conditions to support innovation and growth, as Stephen was saying, that our economies need uh, at this moment to advance uh, the lives of um, people, and also uh, help reduce those uh, debt mountains which we're very familiar with. To answer that question, we need to know what, is, what are the drivers of innovation, and are our actions as policy makers uh, helping or hindering uh, those drivers? As you've heard, in the UK, as in the US, our economy relies predominantly <coughs> on the outputs of business with intangible assets, uh, including IP, and firms in the UK invest more in those areas uh, than they do now in physical assets. So that means getting the IP right, uh, regime right, is vital if we're to ensure innovation and growth. Not just for the sake of existing rights holders, but also for new innovative businesses and for consumers. That regime impacts on our ability to sell goods and services around the world, uh, our competitiveness across a wide range of business sectors, from creative industries to technology-based services, retail models, advanced manufacturing. So it's a very broad perspective. <coughs> Last year, uh, as uh, happened uh, in the US, our then new coalition government recognized the importance of getting the IP system fit for purpose, fit to support growth. And that's why our Prime Minister David Cameron commissioned Professor Ian Hargreaves uh, to look at the IP system and how it could do more to help the UK economy grow. Ian Hargreaves concluded that the IP system was not keeping pace changes to technology and markets, particularly in the area of digital technologies. So the Hargreaves Review and the UK government's response emphasised the importance of uh, adjusting and reforming our IP system to stimulate both technology and content creation and to help deliver that innovation and growth that we want to see. What I'd like to do in uh, this talk, uh, which is headed enforcement, and I will talk about enforcement, uh, but I'd like to place that in the context of three of the key recommendations of Professor Hargreaves' review to show the steps that we're now taking uh, to try and deliver those. First, I'll talk about the importance of patent system reform to ensure that patents are genuinely promoting rather than impeding innovation. Secondly, the challenge of building a copyright system which is respons responsive to the needs of the digital age. And thirdly, uh, uh, talking about uh, a viable IP enforcement strategy. Underpinning our delivery of all these recommendations is our work with key international partners such as the United States. And we've set that out also in uh, an international strategy which I'll touch on. So to start with patents, Globally, as I'm sure most people in this audience will know, one of the great strains on the innovation system is the ever-growing backlog of unprocessed patent applications as patent offices struggle to keep pace with increased demand. Our office first published a report uh, by uh, an economics consultancy, London Economics, on the cost of patent backlogs in March 2010. The report said a year's additional delay, which they, by the way, foresaw happening if nothing was done fairly shortly, in processing patent applications would cost the global economy about $10 million. said that uh, the backlogs uh, will cost the global economy about $10 billion. Now I know that some applicants and their attorneys are happy for applications to take as long as they take, but our perspective is that backlogs cause delays which affect more than just the patent applicants. They affect investors who are reluctant to invest in new technologies not protected by a patent. 
they affect innovators who can't take legal action against the patent, uh, against infringers until their patent is granted. And they affect uh, competitors who can't innovate around an invention until they know what the final level of protection will be. So delays do have a negative effect on innovation. They stifle competition and they restrict growth. There's no silver bullet to improve that position. Uh, action needs to be taken on a number of fronts. Of course, additional resources can be put in to help, and I know the US is doing that. But in the long run, I suggest the main focus needs to be on patent offices working smarter rather than harder. So let me talk about uh, progress on some of the main techniques that we're involved in for smarter working. First, we need to find new ways of work sharing. And here, uh, our office and the USPTO have been at the forefront of efforts to encourage work sharing and reduce duplication in patent processing. <clears throat> in April, our minister, Lady Wilcox, and uh, David announced the second year of a fruitful collaboration we have with the USPTO. And that's paralleled by agreements we have with other offices such as Canada and Australia. We're going to have to tell them to adjust again, aren't we? Do, do we need it? No. Right, let's do it. Um, so I'm pleased that um, we've taken a number of measures to facilitate uh, this work sharing. Uh, most recently, uh, the UK office has now got itself online with its patent document and inspection service, uh, which is similar to the U USPTO's pair system. We call it Ipsum. That is Latin, uh, though I didn't choose the name. Uh, Ipsum, uh, which allows free online access to documents from the file of unpublished patents. So that system will offer savings to business, but it will also make it easier for patent offices around the world to understand why our examiners did or did not grant a patent. That helps work sharing, speeds up processing, and therefore helps reduce the backlogs. Things might also be easier if everyone was working to the same rules. Patent law harmonization, which I'm sure Dave will touch on, is once more rising up the agenda. And of course, the America Invents Act has given that a great boost, moving the US to a first file system. For me, greater uh, harmonization of global patent law has the potential to bring uh, real benefits, but it does need to go hand in hand with these practical efforts we are making to reduce duplication. Another mechanism for work sharing where progress is being made is the patent prosecution highway, PPH. As again, I guess many of you may know, the PPH allows applicants receiving a favorable report at their first office the opportunity to re request accelerated treatment by a second office. So in effect, you get to jump the queue in return for addressing the key problems with your application, which allows our offices to work more efficiently. We've recently made the PPH between our own office and the US simpler to use for applicants, and we're looking forward to seeing increased take-up. I know talking to UK companies that uh, they have, a number of them are starting to make our uh, involvement in PPH agreements across the world a key competitive feature, to use that phrase that Stephen was talking about in, in uh, their uh, approach to using the UK office. The PPH works in unison with the Patent Cooperation Treaty, the PCT, which is the world's primary work sharing platform. We think a properly functioning PCT can be an excellent tool for tackling backlogs, but we also think it's nowhere near reaching its potential just at the moment. There is too much rework of the initial international search and too variable quality of work. So we need to change the behavior of applicants <coughs> and offices so that as much as possible of an application for worldwide patent coverage is considered only once. To work towards that goal, uh, in our own small way. Our Prime Minister launched in May last year the UK's PCT Fast Track initiative. So PCT Fast Track allows applicants to benefit from accelerated national examination in the UK 
if they have a positive international preliminary examination report on that. Now, that gives a, ser a service which provides an incentive for applicants to file higher quality applications to amend their application in the international phase to overcome any objections, it reduces duplication, but the maximum benefits of this type of scheme clearly will only come through other offices across the world introducing similar schemes to what we have in the UK. Of course, uh, the nirvana of all these efforts would be a global pattern. In the EU, we've been inching towards uh, our own version of that for our member states. So far, we've taken 40 years and we've lost a couple of countries along the way. Uh, as President Obama noted uh, when he attended the G20 last week, Europe is a complicated place to try and uh, work through the structures. However, I do believe we're now in the final stage of constructing a patent and equally important and common juridical system, which for the first time will ensure consistency of approach across the majority of the EU. These initiatives are all good steps to improve the patent system. What they don't address, of course, is uh, a, a fundamental question, which is the number of patent applications themselves. With the huge filings being made in China, are we on a trajectory which is going to make this even more of a problem for the future? An important dimension to that problem is not simply the question of numbers, but whether the increasing volumes of patents are helping or harming innovation. As uh, the Hargreaves Review noted, too much IP protection is not necessarily a good thing. Evidence suggests that after a certain point, it has a cumulative detrimental effect. But where that point is, is quite difficult, very difficult to determine. So part of the answer can come at looking at these issues from a competition perspective. And uh, the review suggested that our office should have more power to investigate the competitive uh, impact of IP on markets. We're now looking at that in detail, working closely with the UK's Office of Fair Trade. I shall be talking here uh, during my visit to the US competition authorities, and I know that Dave has also begun a dialogue with them, which we're keen to replicate. <coughs> we're also doing research ourselves on the uh, thorny, if that's not a uh, interesting word to use, the thorny issue of patent clusters, um, which uh, is also quite contentious just at the moment. So patents, there's a big, um, there's a big uh, piece of work to be done, but can I now also turn to copyright, which was in some ways the primary focus of the department's report. For millions of consumers, of course, copyright impinges on their daily lives, whether it's sharing family photos online, quoting other people in a blog post or burning a CD. The consequences can indeed be unpredictable. In uh, 2009, to take an example, an American student, Justin Grobronski's copy of Orwell's 1984, was deleted from his Kindle because of a licensing dispute, rendering the notes that he made unusable. This being the US, naturally he sued uh, whoever he could find to uh, recover his damages. Anyway, the Hargreaves Review's premise was that we shouldn't prevent copyright over-regulating activities that don't prejudice its central objective, namely the provision of incentives to creators. The removal of unnecessary and disproportionate copyright regulation from businesses, individuals, and other groups would, he believed, help to encourage innovation and provide new opportunities for economic growth. Of course, copyright remains a very important protection the UK has a vibrant creative sector which is just, justifiably reliant on copyright. But many people, both users and content owners, told Ian Hargreaves that it was too difficult, too costly, and too time consuming to access copyright material. So, to try and make that market work better, he proposed uh, a, a thing called the Digital Copyright Exchange sort of online copyright shop through which businesses could advertise their ownership of copyrights and buy and sell licenses to use them. We argued that a digital copyright exchange would provide a bigger market for licensed copyright material. 
He saw the immediate beneficiaries from a transparent, efficient digital copyright exchange to be both firms delivering new bundles of content services to existing technology and firms aiming to introduce new services using new devices or software systems presenting content to consumers in new ways. In the last four years, we've seen uh, Apple build new businesses worth about 1.6 billion pounds a year in profits from doing the second of those things. But the ability for small and niche provide service providers to compete in these types of markets is limited by the cost and the complexity of rights and position. That means the markets themselves are less competitive than they otherwise would be, and the range of consumer office offerings is restricted. Of course, bringing a digital copyright exchange into being will be a challenging proposition. But there is a huge level of interest, certainly in the UK, in what that might be. It is an idea that's gathering momentum. There are a lot of initiatives being taken worldwide, from international institutions like WIPO to universities like Stanford, who are working with industry partners to create a marketplace for exchanging and using academic content and course materials. So we believe it's well worth investing time and effort in trying to get this off the ground. We also, in the area of the copyright plan, to tackle the difficult area of orphan works. We believe there are substantial opportunities for growth if we can unlock the many thousands, if not millions, of works which cannot currently be used because they can be identified at home. With Seascore, the center of digital reproduction of these works will be new opportunities for both cultural and commercial organizations. <coughs> The copyright regime which is fit for the digital age also has to address the right boundary between beyond which protection is not justified. So copyright should not impede legitimate activity as defined through the exceptions to copyright law. And while the UK government wants to ensure that copyright maintains its incentives, it also believes there's a strong case for ensuring it doesn't unduly obstruct the use of new technologies, for instance, in the cause of scientific research. Professor Hargreaves looked at whether introducing the US fair use system would benefit growth in the UK. But your system is, uh, dare I say it, relatively unique and uh, does not easily translate to Europe. So instead, he noted that the maximum benefits are likely to be delivered by broader copyright exceptions within the existing EU framework. That's work we'll be taking forward within the UK. And in the long term, we'd like to see further flexibility built into the EU framework, supporting the development of an EU system adaptable to future technologies. And that's something we're now starting to explore with our EU partners. Thirdly, enforcement. Um, the importance of effective enforcement. The Harbury's review called for a balanced and overall effective approach to enforcement. He made some strong recommendations about the transparent use of evidence, particularly in the enforcement area, and provided a wealth of supporting information and studies. Enforcement covers a huge <coughs> range of different activities, from tackling illegal downloading by individuals, stopping criminals trying to make money from IP theft, to ensuring innovators can protect their patents from infringing the same enforcement approach will not be appropriate for all these different types of activities. One area which we will be taking forward is helping small firms to get justice when their IP is infringed. Evidence pre presented to the Hargreaves Review indicated that small and medium-sized firms <coughs> were dissuaded from enforcing their IP rights because of the fear of high court costs. In the last year, we've made improvements to the UK court system to make it easier for small firms for small firms to bring cases and protect their own theft. And we'll be taking forward further steps um, on a small claims court to uh, try and improve that further. One of the most politically difficult areas, uh, both here and in the UK, is effective and proportionate enforcement to tackle internet piracy. In the UK, we are pressing ahead with the Digital Economy Act's initial obligations on internet service providers to send notification letters to, to 
to those of their subscribers who are alleged to be infringing copyright online. We are discussing with the ISPs how best they can do that. However, a recent court case demonstrates that the UK's legal framework can already be an effective tool to tackle online piracy. The News Being 2 judgment demonstrates that copyright owners can seek an offer injunction through existing legislation if they choose to do so. That case has recently encouraged rights holders in the UK to ask BT, one of our key ISPs, to restrict access to a further website, the Pirate Bay website, one of the largest illegal websites serving the UK. Uh, the position is that BT uh, will be looking for court, a court decision before it uh, takes action. It shows that there's a bit of a snowball uh, gathering case. However, reducing piracy and infringement is not just about enforcement. I suspect that uh, Ian Hargreaves was right to say that technology will continue to challenge the assertion of rights and consumers will continue to want what technology can do, even where rights owners are and not very keen to allow them. Firms have little choice but to sell into that sort of uh, less than clear-cut uh, environment. So our conclusion is that there needs to be a three-pronged strategy to reduce the infringement. First, as with the digital copyright exchange, to make legal use of IP easier. Secondly, to educate users about the consequences of infringement. Thirdly, to ensure these effective enforcement mechanisms. Finally, I'd just like to say a little bit about the <coughs> approach that we take. Uh, I'm here in the US today because we do have to think globally if we're to provide a sufficiently attractive framework for our businesses. Our international strategy, which is published alongside the government response to the Harvard review, and there are copies, a few copies of both of those documents table over, over on my left, sets out how we intend to do that. There are, again, three elements, even to remember the three. There are three elements uh, to, uh, to our strategy. First of all, we want to see a well-functioning global IP framework, and I've touched on some of the key issues that raises for uh, the patents framework. Secondly, we recognize the importance of good national regimes of the world over. We want a level playing field for protection and enforcement of our IP rights. To help this in the UK, we are strengthening our ties with international partners by again following a great US precedent and establishing an international network of UK IP petitions who will offer UK uh, support for UK policy positions overseas to help UK businesses operate in new markets. Our UK China attache uh, has now been selected and will take post by the end of the year. And we hope to announce uh, further appointments, including uh, in the Americas uh, by mid 2012. And thirdly, we want to ensure that the international IP framework strikes the right balance between industrial and development priorities. And Stephen touched on that in the introduction. It needs to support economic development in low income countries and it needs to help mitigate global issues like public health uh, and climate change. So in conclusion, uh, with the help of uh, this very recent uh, review in the UK, we've looked hard at the question I have found at the beginning of my talk. How do we create the best conditions to support innovation and growth? I guess my key message from the UK today is that our government recognises at the highest level critical role that IP plays in that recovery, and we want to be in the forefront of helping design the systems which are going to allow that, and also implementing them effectively. Thank you very much. People labeled a newbie there with a little bit of amplification. Well, look, uh, it's always interesting to be the, uh, the last uh, formal speaker in a situation like this, where everything's been said, but not everyone has said it yet. <coughs> so I'll try and make a few comments, but leave a lot of time for, uh, for Q&A this morning and for what I hope will be a very vibrant discussion. Uh, first of all, good morning. Uh, my thanks to the folks from uh, ITIF and to uh, Steve Azell for 
bringing us together this morning for a very interesting discussion and for inviting the U.S. Trademark Office to uh, participate this morning. And of course, um, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to my colleague from the U.K., Chief Executive and Comptroller General of the U.K. IPO, and friend, John Alby. Um, you know, in my uh, tenure at USPTO, uh, I've had the opportunity to work uh, pretty closely with John, and I will tell you there is no more earnest advocate for the goals of the 21st century IP system than uh, John Alty. So thank you, John, for traveling all the way over here to the U.S. Um, and, and participated in this discussion and for spending time in our country talking about uh, intellectual property related issues. Now, um, Steve mentioned in his opening comments uh, issues regarding IP intensive industries. Um, I couldn't agree more um, on the importance of better understanding championing IP intensive industries on the lines of enforcement, of course. You know, and to that end, uh, no less than just this morning. Finding that uh, a study finding that uh, the IP intensive companies and industries last what they call accountants. I might have heard before, but I think it stands for lack a way for the finance people to put the value of the stuff, the patents, the trademarks, the copyrights, the trade secrets, and the intangible uh, capital on the books of the company. This is something. Uh, we're interested in looking at at USPTO, we're interested in collaborating with others here in the U.S. and the U.S. government and with other um, countries. Uh, the U.K. would always come right up to the top of that list uh, in order to, to apply that issue and understand it better and then create the accountancy discipline uh, for intellectual property and intellectual assets. You know, there's no question that um, John, Alpi, and myself, um, as we address you in a critical time in all of our um, IP histories, if you will, our IP systems, um, in the world where commerce uh, is increasingly transcending border, transcending regions, it's global in nature, and innovators are seeking more and more to um, enter markets abroad, um, into this environment it is, to say the least, uh, imperative that the international IP system provide consistent, cost-effective, and expeditious ways to uh, reliably uh, protect innovation um, in multiple jurisdictions, in fact, globally. You know, new products uh, can have one foot in nanotechnology and a second foot in software, and if I could stretch the metaphor beyond the uh, usual, yeah, we're going to have now three feet. Bring my dog in the room for this one. Uh, third foot in uh, the biological sciences, and on and on and on. Um, and of course, they're all designed, developed, and manufactured. These products are distributed, used in global, and often uh, one that transcends national borders and national patent laws. And while these realities are welcome, many of the companies and firms certainly hallmarks of 21st century innovation. They also demand collective and intelligent engagement and a smarter global IP infrastructure to keep up. And it's uh, through collective synergy collaboration that I believe we have a unique opportunity right now to meet these challenges. And I believe it's imperative uh, that we act by moving on that opportunity, particularly in an area that I'll focus on a little bit, uh, not mention I would, and I will at this point anyway on that area of global patent monetization, not to in any way uh, omit the other important areas of intellectual property, but to focus on that one for just a moment um, as an example, because while the dynamics of our economic landscape may be shifting, importance of IP rights uh, is not shifting. IP is the, the 
your global currency for creating value from for services and products from innovation in all markets and in all countries. But unfortunately, with our current IP system so very innovators uh, and patent offices around the world are having to repeat time and time again, um, countless times per year, uh, the same work over and over again, ultimately wasting uh, billions of dollars a year, and I guess it should translate that if you have about a pound 38 pounds now, but a lot of pounds too, uh, clogging up these pendency pipelines and uh, devaluing that currency of innovation. So to devise real solutions to this problem and cut down on workload dependencies, we simply must get better at collaborating and to truly enable um, global innovation to flourish, we need to take concrete steps to harmonize our substantive patent laws and isolate on that area. Greater harmonization is just essential to the efficient functioning of our respective systems. There's potential to literally unleash millions of jobs globally, driving growth for all of our economies. Now, our approach needs to begin with a global dialogue, inclusive of both developed and developing countries. And this is something that we were not very good at in our failed attempts at colonization um, in the 90s and uh, in the part of the last decade. We need to gain a better understanding of everybody's needs and concerns, as well as flexibilities. We need to learn also why each of us considers a specific approach to be a best practice worth the inclusion in the global gold standard uh, patent system that we're envisioning. The US and the UK uh, already have an exceptional track record when it comes to collaborating. I'll mention a little bit of that, uh, especially in the efforts. And it's a relationship that I believe will prove instrumental in advancing global harmonization discussions in the patent area um, more generally. When an inventor's patent application is being processed in multiple countries all at once, um, work sharing systems enable offices to utilize each other's search um, and examination results and avoid duplication of work in a much more expeditious review process. While at the same time, fortunately, boosting our patent quality overall, um, and that shouldn't be any surprise because that's what happens when multiple perspectives are brought to bear on the review of a single patent application. Now, with respect to um, a program known as the Patent Prosecution Highway, or PPH, more than 8,000 uh, applications have made their way through the US PTO version of that program now, allowing for the efficiency and quality of the patent examination in those 8,000 plus cases to be enhanced simply by virtue of this global collaboration um, under a separate work sharing arrangement with the UK IPO that we have bilaterally uh, with John's office. Search and examine and the examination work from the UK has been shared with us at the USPTO in about uh, 600 corresponding applications, which is a pretty substantial fraction of the work that goes back and forth between our countries. Uh, and the results of examiner surveys of our actual workers, our professionals we've conducted so far, to assess the, uh, their views as to the usefulness and value of the project indicate a high level of reusability and a high degree of confidence in the UK examiner's work and a high degree of satisfaction um, and value seen in that kind of work sharing. And uh, through another, yet another group, there's a lot of them, uh, the trilateral offices, trilateral efforts between the EPO, European Patent Office, the USPTO, and the JPO, the Japan Office, uh, we're engaging, in fact, in, in meetings and discussions of these subjects with the trilateral offices later this week. Um, Europe, we've been able to expand our levels of collaboration further. UK or UK IPO, in fact, recently joined with the USPTO and six other offices 
an enhanced work sharing effort referred to as the Montanai <coughs> pilot originally suggested by the JPO their real name. Um, and inspired by the success of that program, the United States is now leading a conversation to develop new parameters to yet further streamline work sharing procedures by issuing a new approved version of this patent prosecution highway system that we're referring to as PPH 2.0. So I'm throwing a lot of iterations at you here. Uh, but with all of them having an eye on uh, the work done with the partnership between the USPTO and the UK IPO, uh, we are including many harmonization efforts uh, based on this patent prosecution highway forward all at once, all at once. So we truly appreciate Mr. Alti's support uh, what we think are important changes and improvements to our work sharing efforts. And we also firmly believe that um, this approach to strengthening the global IP infrastructure continue to deliver uh, benefits to users on a worldwide basis. Moreover, the Council of the European Union, of course, as John mentioned, has taken critical steps of its own in the harmonization area the creation of the single patent system, uh, one that will place the status quo of individually granted rights in each country um, with a single right. Of course, the rules are still uh, being worked out, adopted, but the U.S. applauds the EU's efforts and leadership in streamlining and strengthening its IP infrastructure. We believe that not only will this reduce patenting costs uh, for all countries in Europe, uh, but it represents an, another nice step forward for global patent harmonization more generally. Now, if by all of these projects working together we can eliminate repeated work, free up resources for inventors and patent offices and of courts, we ultimately right, will generate the economic lift that comes from moving ideas in the marketplace more efficiently and more quickly. Um, and um, further helping with this, at the large scale level, uh, at an international level, we've begun engaging in the deep substance now, the ideal of an improved global patent system by identifying specific areas of law where further coordination and development across our jurisdictions uh, can be helpful. Specifically, at meeting in Tegernsee, Germany this past summer, several important topics were selected for comprehensive study, and that study will and is analyzing the uh, unique legal and um, conceptual differences between our various uh, patent laws, uh, identifying points where possible convergence uh, is available and is developing plans to move forward right now, in fact, that. Now, as we try to build further momentum on our um, recent specific meetings, the leaders of the IP world, right, both the private sector and in our major offices like the UK IPO, the US PTO, need to take uh, a leadership position. We need to own our role, right, and continue to engage international business community in making and uh, making the case for why the global commercial system demands a harmonized global patent law uh, and a global innovation architecture that can simply keep up with it. Let me assure you that the United States uh, will continue to do our part, as you're all aware by now, about a month and a half ago, President Obama signed um, of sweeping patent reform legislation we've seen in this country in about 175 years, if you count, uh, completely remaking the U.S. Uh, patent system basically from the ground up. This new law, in my view, vastly improves the ability of businesses, inventors, uh, entrepreneurs to turn breakthroughs into products and services contribute to economic growth um, in our country and beyond. Now, while the USPTO is currently uh, working on a number of challenges in implementing 
the various provisions of this law, uh, which of course the American Defense Act, or the government seems it is what it's called. We have working groups already hard at work, been at hard at work, in fact, since immediately when the legislation was signed by the president, charging forward with a very transparent implementation process, including extensive outreach uh, and seeking of input from the public stakeholder community. So if you're not already participating, go to our website. You can easily find our America Defense Act microsite. You can literally submit comments and go directly into the agency to our implementation coordinator directly from our website. So it's very easy to become part of the process. Uh, we're uh, holding public hearings, of an extensive public hearing on every aspect of the legislation. Something like 10 rulings and packages will be coming out in January, we're conducting, I think, it's six studies. So there is a lot that's going on. You can keep up with all of it on our, uh, on our member side. Now, the new law clearly represents a major step towards transforming the U.S. patent system to account for the stresses and expectations of a 21st century global economy. The AIA has already begun enhancing our patent system by offering greater certainty about patent rights, faster examination times, and discounts for small businesses, and alternatives to expensive litigation when patent rights are uh, disputed. Uh, in fact, um, I mentioned in a meeting last week, and it was reported this morning in some of the IP specialty media that track one process which was initiated 10 days after the president signed the legislation is already just a little over a month after the process started um, uh, yielded its first notice of allowance in the patent application. So that's pretty remarkable by any stretch. A patent application going from its first original filing to the notice of allowance in one month. We didn't think we could handle really expedited review under track one, I'm here to tell you we can prove and we're proving that we certainly can handle it. That's not a paid endorsement for track one. Use it if you like, it's going really well. Um, uh, but uh, it, it is a way that if you've got clients with fast patent protection, um, now you've got a way to <coughs> Now ultimately, the move engineered by the AIA um, to create a more effective patent system through provisions uh, like the modern grace period is anchored in the desire to more effectively match the rate and pace of uh, innovation with the rate and pace of commercialization and the rate and pace of invention. Right? And in distinguishing between invention and innovation, we realize that there really is a difference that uh, innovation is the economically relevant version of invention. So the goal, with that in mind, of the America Defense Act is not just to create the simplest possible patent system, but the most precise possible patent system. We did not set out to create, nor did we create the Swiss watch of patent systems, but we rather created the most innovation-friendly and inventor-friendly and collaboration-friendly patent system that reduces costs, um, levels of playing field for businesses small and large, and spurs economic growth. Not only boosts interactions between innovators and, um, and investors, it more swiftly drives breakthroughs from lab to delivery to the marketplace. To be clear, the US has engaged in this set of essential reforms, not as part of any international negotiation or gain leverage in some quid pro quo bargain, but simply because it was the right thing to do. We'll continue in that regard, working with other offices, including UK IPO, in that same spirit, because we believe that when patent laws enhance collaboration rather than impeding it, everybody wins. So, I look forward to thoughtful discussion, yourself, John, and folks in the room today, and a continued strong partnership between the USPTO and the UK IPO. Um, you know, collaboration between our two
two offices grounded in this ethic of global stewardship, I believe really can show the world how between two countries we can build a system that incubates the ideas that brings great technologies to the marketplace, that offers the highest quality of patent reviews, uh, and that produces a better innovation system and more opportunity uh, all across the board. A benefit to innovators and governments alike, I believe, will write the next great chapter to economic growth for all of us. So thank you very much for the the discussion. Thank you, John and David, for those excellent set of remarks. I just wanted to uh, ask about four or five questions of our panelists here, and we'll open it up to audience Q&A. Before asking questions, though, one thing I wanted to mention, as these gentlemen have laid out how critically important it is that countries have strong IP environments. Uh, ITIF will be releasing two different reports over the next three months. Uh, the first, uh, which is actually uh, being released in Honolulu today at the APEC ministerial meeting, will benchmark the 21 APEC economies on 84 indicators of innovation policy, uh, one of the core areas of which is uh, uh, IPR protection. And then in February, we'll expand that study to be a 55 nation analysis of countries' innovation policy environments. And, and again, with uh, IPR, it's more of a seven or more. So look for those expanded reports coming from ITIF. So again, gentlemen, thank you for uh, those great comments. Um, obviously, David's uh, passage of the American Defense Act is a real win for American innovators. And it provides mechanisms to deal uh, with what has become uh, a very long uh, patent pendency period uh, and backlog. Uh, latest data I saw from the New York Times said we had about uh, 1.2 million uh, patent applications outstanding, 700,000 of which uh, are in process, 500,000 of which are, are pending. Uh, my question is, uh, with the uh, changed processes and the increased resources coming to us through AI, uh, would you hazard a, a guess as to where we'll be in, in say, two years uh, with that that lot of patents, and will we be able to decrease the tenancy rates? Yeah, thanks, Steve. So the good news is we actually have made some progress. We managed to bring that big backlog down so far from its top, and our administration started up about 750,000 of the patent applications to at the end of this last financial year, so about a month. So we had it down to 669. We actually had it down uh, to the lowest level in about five years. We've made some progress. We've got a long way to go. Um, we actually want to have a reasonable inventory like any business. You have to have it, you want to have an inventory of working process. And for us, that inventory is uh, somewhere around um, 350,000 or so applications um, in process at any one period of time. So. Um, if we're able to keep access to the resources we're collecting and uh, hire the 1,500 or so examiners we're trying to hire this year, um, we I believe that uh, we'll make significant additional progress on that backlog. Um, could be we could see it in the 600,000 by the end of this year. I think our projections show 620,000. Uh, we have about 620,000 by the end of this year. But there are some assumptions built in that if we can improve on those assumptions, I think we can go even, even somewhat lower. Uh, so, you know, when you think about it, at that point now, you know, if we were able to make it by the end of the year, somewhere near 600,000, now you've whittled off, you know, 150,000 applications. You've got 600, 150 to go. You're, you're starting to, you know, get within the range and by then you have enough examiners in order to get the rest of this backlog cleared off, I would say, in about two additional years or so. So we are making some progress. Um, we do have a long way to go. By the way, everyone can watch our progress quite transparently on our dashboard board on the USPTO website. It's easily linked from our home page. You can see the number of really starting to you know, do little dog legs, if I can go back to the uh, feed analogy. And uh, some of the numbers are starting to head down quite rapidly, which is a very good thing. John, one of the goals of our American Defense Act was
was really to get out issue of high quality patents in the United States. That's the sine qua nine of the fluid IPR system. So we've invented new method, we've introduced new mechanisms such as the ability to provide ex ante information up front about uh, the prior art in the field to help the patent examiners. We have initiated a post grant review process now. What can the U.S. learn from what the U.K. has done or what you've seen in the Congress report about how we can further this goal of issuing only high quality patents? Uh, thank you. Well, um, again, there's probably no one silver bullet to this, but um, I think, uh, as uh, Dave said, um, looking at what we can do internationally, um, the work sharing uh, uh, activities we undertake definitely do uh, help with quality as well as efficiency. So, uh, you know, it's undoubtedly the case that however good examiners are, uh, there is an increasing amount of material to search um, as, uh, uh, as innovations start happening uh, around the world, uh, uh, China, of course, Japan, uh, it, it's a very different situation from what it was 20 years ago. So that international collaboration becomes even more important. We also followed uh, the US uh, in piloting um, making it easier for third parties to comment uh, on uh, patent applications. Uh, so that uh, has always been possible in the UK, uh, but we uh, introduced uh, uh, the so-called peer-to-patent system, uh, which I know Dave uh, has championed uh, here, which uh, just makes it um, easier and better organized and reduces uh, materials. So we don't know this, uh, it's a sort of a wiki system which um, uh, not only allows people to comment but then uh, takes those comments and puts them in some sort of shape for the examiners, ranks them in terms of usefulness. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing how that pilot uh, works out. I guess the last thing I would say on this score, and again it goes back to international collaboration, is that um, we have we have in the UK a quite intense uh, collaboration with uh, the Canadian office and the Australian office. Uh, we formed a little group which we call the Vancouver Group. Um, we, uh, our all offices are of a roughly similar size and uh, we uh, have a, a more or less common uh, uh, patent law background. Uh, and what we've started to do there, which I think is uh, doesn't sound as big a step as perhaps it is, is have peer review of our quality across offices. So uh, we, we have uh, developed some common quality standards amongst our three offices, uh, and uh, that means that we have a degree of external um, uh, benchmarking and audit. So uh, that, that those are some of the things that we're, that we're uh, Progressing um, particularly internationally to improve the quality. So, as you both know, uh, China has announced a national patent development strategy from 2011 to 2020, and it seems, John, from how you are describing the UK's work, uh, this might actually amount to some sort of uh, domestic and international intellectual strategy policy for the UK. Uh, what does that give you? Uh, in terms of a nation, and, and David, does the U.S. need a national uh, intellectual property strategy? Well, Steve, um, I think we do, starting from the back end of the question, I think we do need a national intellectual property strategy, and in fact, the U.S. BPO is working on writing one uh, right now. We've been working on that for quite a while, uh, several months, and are uh, making some progress. We have the lead on that, administration uh, writing what will be our, our country's first ever intellectual property uh, strategy. So um, clearly is needed in the U.S. Uh, I don't know that it'll include targets for patent filings. I frankly think that targets for patent filings are uh, focusing on the wrong thing. Um, uh, you know, you, you could quite arbitrarily uh, you know, manufacture numbers of patent filings either up or down uh, depending on by virtue of just strategic actions on the part of the government or the private sector. So, number of patent filings isn't going to be an issue for us. It's how to foster 
strong balanced um, intellectual property system that maximally fac facilitates the creation of opportunity, wealth, uh, innovative products and services, jobs, etc. Uh, so returning to the first part of your question, China does indeed have an aggressive strategy going out to 2020. Um, it includes, I think, uh, numbers that would make uh, and, and likely will make China the largest um, uh, invention patent granting authority in the world and aggressive hiring plans, I think the hire as many as, the, have as, as 9,000 examiners. USPTO is currently the largest office. We have somewhere around 7,000 examiners. So if we meet our hiring plans this year, we'll have maybe 8,000 or so if you take uh, attrition, you know, retirements and resignations and things like that into account. So uh, uh, you're talking about ambitious plans. I think for China, I think they're just fine actually, I think they all point in a direction toward China wanting to join the developed world, if you will, join the UK and the US and have an innovation driven, an innovation driven economy, an economy that respects intellectual property and uh, I think the, the, the more they move in that direction, the faster they'll come up speed for the entertainment industry, for the software industry, for the pharmaceutical industry, for the bio industry, for the communications industry, you shouldn't forget the information technology industry, and all other areas where, uh, where the U.S. has had leadership in respecting our intellectual property. Um, uh, this world history shows time and time again that countries um, begin respecting, protecting others' intellectual property when they have some of their own. Uh, and and uh, no surprise there. So I welcome China uh, joining part. Um, well, uh, there's not a huge amount to, I, I'd want to add to that. Um, I would agree um, that um, uh, the situation in China is changing quite uh, quickly uh, in relation to its own self-interest in IP. Um, there is the question of um, numbers. Um, I recently was in China and also in South Korea, which um, uh, for an economy that size, the number of patent filings is, is quite extraordinary. Um, and as that internationalizes, then it does, I think, uh, create um, challenges for us, which is why we need to make progress on uh, some of the things we both talked about uh, in terms of harmonization and um, removing duplication. Um, I think uh, there is a bit of a danger in having uh, sort of targets or, or regarding the numbers as the be-all and end-all. That's why the research that I talked about into um, patent thickets um, is quite interesting and important. Um, and other discussions that are going on about um, um, how, uh, how significant the effectiveness needs to be to, to warrant a new patent. Um, just to pick up your last point, um, the UK, in the UK, um, we've had quite a few reviews of intellectual property uh, with an aim to give a, I guess, a sort of strategy over the last few years. Uh, indeed, one of the um, requests that the industry made uh, when the latest Harvey's review was being done was that the government committee itself had no further reviews of IP uh, for the lifetime of this parliament. Um, uh, which, which it did. Um, I think uh, we just, what, what we tried to do with the um, Hargreaves review, which in effect becomes our the basis for our strategy, was to focus on a limited number of key areas, not to try and um, cover the whole waterfront. Um, Hargreaves came up with 10 recommendations. Um, and uh, you know, that was deliberate to treat, keep the uh, focus because otherwise um, we will just uh, try and bite off all the and chew. And we want to try and focus our uh, attention on things that are going to have some measurable impact on growth in the reasonably uh, early term. Good. And staying with China for my final question. 
fantastic article from last year in the Harvard Business Review by Thomas Howard and Mahesh Gamelot called China vs. the World, Whose Technology Is It Anyway? make clear that one of China's key strategies is uh, essentially uh, intellectual property transfer, uh, forcing in a number of industries, whether high-speed rail or aviation, the transfer of technology or intellectual property transfer to the Chinese market as a condition of market access. How do you think our system is based for trade enforcement in the US and the UK? Uh, we rely on companies to come forward in a process uh, with USDR and, and raise trade cases, despite the fact that this is happening to multinational corporations, which are the most other countries, for having to go forward to their own regulators. My question is, how can uh, greater IT enforcement strategies on nations help companies deal with this challenge of forced uh, IP transfer as a condition of market access? Big question. Um, I mean, I think first uh, we have to start with um, the fact that we are going to have a multilateral set of trade rules um, through WTO, which China is a member, um, which I don't think envisage that sort of uh, uh, arrangement. So um, we have to argue the case for, um, uh, for like open markets and. Um, uh, frameworks which uh, are uh, allowed for competition. Um, and I know that uh, maybe they will want to comment that the US has pushed strongly in China uh, to uh, uh, try to dissuade the Chinese from these sorts of policies which um, uh, require a sort of contribution to Chinese innovation uh, in. Uh, uh, in, re in, re in return for market access. Um, of course, um, companies individually have to make their own decisions about what they are prepared to do and what they see as being in their own interest. I was in China, uh, as I said earlier this year, and I talked to a lot of UK companies operating there um, who have very different strategies for developing their own businesses. Uh, in China. Um, we have a number of IP enforcement problems, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, there are very few com companies, however, who are very anxious for the UK government to uh, uh, speak publicly about their interests. There are one or two exceptions for that, and there are other companies who are happy for us to raise um, their cases privately with the Chinese. Uh, there are some companies who have quite different views about um, the, um, the difficulty of doing business in, in China, uh, talking about China, of course, there are other, other developing economies where these sorts of issues arise. So I think that for government, it's about uh, trying to set up a world trading system which is uh, about open market within uh, uh, proper uh, enforceable um, frameworks. Uh, but I think we always have to recognize that uh, within that within that basic framework, there's a limit to how much um, companies may want to do, and that companies will have, have to work out their own strategies. Well, Steve, the only thing I would uh, add to that is that, of course, uh, uh, here in the U.S., USTR has done a good job of uh, pursuing those kinds of issues, and I think that the IP laws alone really can't handle those kinds of issues. Uh, trade policy is there to handle them. One of the comment I would make is that uh, relative to the closely related Chinese indigenous innovation uh, policy, uh, I think we did make some good headway at the JCCT meeting last November in getting the Chinese to uh, back away from that policy. We're not hearing about anything about it since then. Now we have another JCC, our annual JCCT meeting coming up in a few weeks in Chengdu, China, uh, and we'll be pursuing a number of these issues in, in follow-up, including, importantly, trying to get the Chinese to adopt uh, the, the important positive features of the special IPR enforcement campaign that they ran starting last October through this uh, June to make that program permanent, including uh, uh, recommending, as we have been, the 
to establish a, a permanent office, state council level, um, as, an, as an enforcement vehicle. Uh, we'll also be talking with them, I hope, about other issues, including camp courting, issues that are of, uh, of great importance to U.S. industry. Um, that particular one is of importance to the entertainment industry. There are other issues, such as uh, software legalization, simply getting the government and big businesses in China pay for the software that they're using that we've been working on it will be raising all of those issues I expect um, again very soon. Great, thank you both. Well, let's open it to the audience then for about 10 or 15 minutes worth of questions. I'll take them as I see them. Okay. Okay. Well, please, uh, if you would, yeah, introduce yourself. My name is Casey Olver, and my sister is Casey University. The research is the experiments and artists that have been put on. And uh, your question is that I can get back to the Davis commentary when patent laws enhance collaboration, everyone wins. So there are this like the second side of enforcement. There's no dynamics here. It's the tradability side. And then it's also the trading technology such like patent law. And so there's a sort of second dimensional quality to the patent. That they're not only enforceable for exclusion and protection of sorts, but there's an increasing dynamics here. And I wonder if you have uh, your thoughts on this and if you're working patents more tradable internationally globally. And the follow-up on that, of course, uh, is what both address the story between developing and developing economies. So how could you enhance such trade or exchange between developed and developing economies? So the one billion basically who have it all are the sellers, and we have the six billion who are increasingly getting uh, into this business, and that they are the buyers. So how would you have Well, you talked about um, quality and tradability, and um, uh, are we doing things to um, encourage tradability? I mean, first, just on quality again, to to underline that what all our customers say to us, I expect that you know, Davis to do to him as well, is that quality is the most important uh, issue for them. Uh, we have debates with them at times about uh, speed and so forth, um, and uh, we're able to uh, provide speed and patterns where uh, they're needed. But um, quality is definitely the number one uh, requirement. Um, on tradability, I, mean, I would say that um, what we focused on as an office um, because in a way the use that's been made of the patents once they've been granted uh, is not our direct responsibility. We have uh, done quite a lot of work um, in relation to um, the commercialization of, um, of research and um, enabling uh, universities to uh, reach agreements with, uh, with companies which is a sort of form of tradability, and it, it is, does involve licensing, as you said, because that's an area where, I guess, um, the UK has certainly tended to regard itself as lagging um, the US, for instance. I think that over the last 10 years or so, actually the situation has changed quite a lot, and I think we have um, a group of universities who are very research intensive, and who now are very um, uh, savvy and sensible about the way that they license their IP. But nevertheless, that's the area that we put most effort into. Uh, we have a set of model agreements, so-called Lambert agreements, which, um, uh, we, we, which people have told us they found useful uh, as a basis for those sorts of contractual arrangements. Um, so that, that's what I'd say about that. On developing and developed countries, uh, yes, I, I'm glad to have the opportunity just to say a little bit more about this, um, picking up on what uh, Stephen said earlier. Um, I think we would um, say that the picture is uh, a little bit more uh, complex or sophisticated um, simply than developed and developing. Uh, we have a, a 
without being too granular about it, because we have the Western developed economies, we have a set of economies like Brazil and China uh, and uh, some others who really are um, uh, growing very fast and, and adopting um, uh, increasingly um, positive attitude towards intellectual property. And then we have some very poor countries um, uh, for whom uh, IP uh, and IPR is not really the key development issue. So we think our approach has to um, uh, take account of those different uh, categories. Um, and so uh, for the least developed, uh, we think that the best way to, if you like, get the um, uh, ensure that the IPR system is seen as something positive and, and doesn't uh, risk developing into something negative is to take a more flexible approach. Um, and our business actually agrees with us on this because these are not big markets for UK companies. Uh, what we want to do is show people a path on which they can uh, uh, walk towards um, uh, IP protections and an IP system, um, but it's going to be one that is, um, uh, that is attuned to their current state of development. Great. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, Chris Fall from the Office of Naval Research. Uh, I think uh, this idea of crowdsourcing, uh, you know, back and forth, is really fascinating. I'm wondering if you guys could expand on that a little. Do you anticipate uh, trademarks and so called going down that road? Sourcing of patent examination, I think, holds tremendous promise for um, uh, getting better prior art and succinct comments in front of examiners. Our pilots um, with New York Law School have shown that the uh, uh, smart members of the public will put in really great documents that are otherwise hard for examiners to find and will pinpoint the parts of them that are applicable. So now that the AIA is in place at USPTO, we're busily working on implementing the IT systems that we need to make it easy for members of the public to, come to submit prior art and commentary online for free not going to charge anything for people who submit online and who submit modest numbers of, of references in order to encourage uh, participation in the system. We're also working on a second aspect of, of the peer to patent pilot that was pretty powerful, which is collaboration among the uh, commentary community. And that's where you get into the issues of uh, you know, what you might call collateral damage or unintended consequences or, or whatever terms you use. Well, you do have to be careful and you have to show respect for the rights of the IP owner uh, to not wind up having this process devolved into a pre-grant opposition, which is something we are not going to do and something that uh, I think would, would work very much to the detriment so of, the, um, of the balance of the patent system. So we're trying to achieve the right balance that includes easy comment, that includes collaboration, out having the whole thing kind of become a, uh, uh, you know, a, a frequent opposition system. And I think, frankly, we'll be able to do that. Our philosophy is going to be to keep it as lightweight as possible initially, uh, because what we found in the pilots that we conducted is that the, the commenters were reasonable the vast, vast majority of the time. They put in reasonable references, reasonable quantities of them, reasonable and succinct comments. So we're designing a system that, I would say, reasonably assumes good faith that we've seen already in the past on, on behalf of the commenters. We are not going to require commenters to disclose their identities, to focus their patent prosecution cycle is on the quality of the application, getting the best 
quite hard for front of examiners. It's not on the identity of the discloser. We are also uh, looking at, and I am in favor of, although we haven't made final decisions on this yet, actually giving our examiners extra time to evaluate the prior art that's sent in on the basis that obviously there is going to be some, that, some additional time commitment on their part um, to look at the comments and to think about how the comments apply to the references is something, a facet of examination that they don't normally see uh, when they're just looking at search reports that came in. IDS is submitted by applicants or search reports from overseas with their own search results. So a lot of powerful options available here. This is an area where we'd love to get public comment because the, the, the rule book has not been written. We're just in the process of writing it and we want to do it very collaboratively um, with the IP community. And the last point relative to um, sharing the prior art with other offices, that is a point that is um, you know, yet to be designed and yet to be developed. But there are already mechanisms for sharing that exist, such as when, when one of our examiners uses a piece of art, winds up going into our um, internal file history, which gets shared, for example, with the UK IPO when we share file histories with them. The question that we'll all face is whether we want deeper sharing of the prior art and the commentary pre-application by the examiner. It, that'll wind up in the file history too, but whether we want to send that preliminarily to another office like the UK IPO, question open for discussion that you could, you know, you could find pros and cons uh, for doing that. Um, just to just very briefly, uh, because we are, as I said, a little way uh, behind uh, the US, uh, our pilot is our uh, first pilot is coming to an end uh, towards the end of this year um, but it has generated uh, a fair degree of interest um, one of the perhaps the useful things is that because our system is a bit different from the US system um, we may be able to gain um, new insights uh, into how these things work best so for instance uh, we uh, already publish uh, applications earlier, uh, we didn't have to ask uh, companies whether they were willing to participate in this pilot. We just basically took a, a load of applications and we told the companies that that's what we were doing. Um, generally, with one or two, I gather, exceptions, people would be pretty happy about that. Um, so uh, I think um, we'll, we'll want to review that. Um, uh, and we do see it as uh, something which uh, ought to be uh, harnessable to help us uh, improve in the way we do it.
see about what the language regime should be, which is a pretty important uh, element of cultural um, uh, sort of diversity, I guess. Um, you don't have that problem uh, here in the US, but you would have it on a world scale, possibly, uh, if we tried to get a global uh, pattern. Um, the other, the, the most uh, important issue at the moment, which is also a reflect, I think in the patenting rules area, um, because actually Europe already has a common set of rules for patenting through a thing called the European Patent Convention, that isn't now a big deal. It might be a big deal in terms of changing those rules uh, for the harmonization discussions, which uh, Dave was talking about, we would get different perspectives from different uh, 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 members of the EU, but it's not a big deal for agreeing a common EU patent. The, uh, the issue that is most hot there is the, uh, what court system there will be for enforcement. Um, and there again, if you take the history of um, certainly of the EU, uh, it's issues like judicial systems, um, which play into, uh, are, are deep rooted in the institutional setup of individual countries, which it can be quite difficult to, um, to, to harmonize. Um, I guess, from, again, if you permit me, since you made the reference to uh, sort of philosophy and culture, actually the UK uh, is not really, harmonization is not a very positive word for the UK. We generally aim to have the minimum harmonization necessary to have mutual recognition. Uh, it's just that in some areas that means quite a lot of harmonization. So uh, that, that's our philosophy, that if we don't need to harmonize and we can just mutually recognize what people have done, then that is the best outcome because it's very difficult to harmonize. Let's take two more questions and then we'll wrap it up going over here. Uh, my name is Fritz Adderley, I'm with Motion Picture Association, uh, and I'd like to turn to copyright for a change. Uh, a question for Mr. Aldi, uh, with regard to your statement about the need for a more efficient rights clearance system, uh, we keep track of internet providers of audiovisual services, and at last count, there were some 450 uh, services available on the internet providing audiovisual content, movies, TV shows, all sorts of stuff. Uh, to me, that's pretty strong evidence that the existing rights clearance system is working. Um, what evidence do you have in the audiovisual area that uh, indicates that the system is not working properly? Okay. Um, I guess uh, a couple of comments. First, um, as I said in my talk, a lot of people, uh, I can't remember which of the sectors they were necessarily from, but I suspect they covered most sectors. Uh, a lot of people uh, did express concern that um, rights clearance was not straightforward. Um, we, we do also, for, we are in a dynamic situation, as you said. There's a lot of uh, new services coming forward. Um, uh, if you look at the music industry and the way that's changed over recent years, um, then uh, the, 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 you can clearly see that the market uh, is dynamic and uh, moving in a good direction, I would say. Uh, however, there is often a difference between the um, perspective of the users and the perspective of the suppliers because some of the users want to cut across sectors. Uh, they want to use material that is uh, music, uh, that is film, that is uh, the published word, um, and uh, that can be quite difficult. Uh, equally, um, and it's a debate we've had with publishers in the UK, uh, there are some very good uh, systems and services um, covering part of the territory, uh, but they don't always cover the whole territory, uh, and it can be quite difficult to, um, 
to find um, those bits of the territory that aren't covered. So I would say that um, uh, things are moving in the right direction, definitely. Uh, I would say that the evidence that the review got was that um, there were still problems in terms of the types of application that people wanted to make use of, not simply as a consumer to receive uh, a, a, you know, one product or, or, or a range of, of, of analogous products. Um, but the other thing I would say is that um, the next stage of this process from the UK's point of view um, will be very much what we would see as a feasibility study. So we are not going to, the, the Harvey review was a quick piece of work uh, in terms of uh, government reviews. It pointed up some issues. Uh, we now need to look at those in more detail uh, and we want to do that uh, very much working with the industry. Um, the, the digital copyright exchange concept which I mentioned uh, it's not going to be a government creation, it's not a government IT project, it's got to be something which um, uh, makes sense for the industry. So uh, I will, I would say there's plenty of opportunity for, for those issues to be uh, related to that. Do we have a final question from this side of the room? I hear last word. Uh, good morning, my name is Nick Chidiak, I'm a law student at Turk Law School University. I wanted to ask, uh, under the new rules of the American Fan Act, the Fence Act, um, what publications by an inventor do not preclude a patent filing, and how do you anticipate research universities and technology companies will structure their collaboration? Could you say, Nick, could you say that again? So, uh, what publications by an inventor do not preclude a patent filing, and then how do you anticipate research universities and technology companies will structure their collaboration? Well, first of all, Nick, thanks. Congratulations on being at uh, GW, you said, right? Yes. Uh, we're hiring examiners at the U.S. <laughs> like to have you and other GW students come to work. We're not a third year. We're, we're, we're hiring extensively for uh, internship positions, too. So that's also not a pay for but I to mention that. Now, relative to AIA, you know, the, the regime for determining what constitutes prior art, let's say by a university um, uh, professor as an example, is, it gets much, much simpler. Um, if it amounts to a public disclosure, it's prior art. In fact, there are some key words in the statute right, or, or made otherwise publicly available that really are an attempt to sum up what will be the talisman of determining what becomes prior art or not. Now, Dean John Whalen will give you all the details, as will uh, Chief Judge of the Federal Circuit, uh, Mandy Rader. But just to give you, you know, my little synopsis, the nice thing about the new law is very university friendly, it's very collaboration friendly, and it's very publication friendly because of that grace period. Um, so for those cases where you, where you make something that triggers the publication, you also will trigger the grace period and get yourself a year um, in order to perfect your filing. This is a big distinction over Europe, and in fact there was a report that came out, a European-based report, that, um, that looked at the number of patent filings of many major universities, including in the U.S. and in Europe, and found that in Europe the filing rate is much, much lower than it is in the U.S., and they attributed that to one thing, they attributed it to the grace period. And while, as John and I have both pointed out, neither one of us is big believers in any equation between quantities of patent filings and, and innovative output, one place where you can make a fairly, you know, at least a first order rough equation is in academia, because they think about patent filing very seriously related to serious research. They tend to be, you know, they tend to not be all that well funded, so they so money's a big thing, so they economize on their filings, they only make patent filings where they really, really need to. And in the US, as uh, probably a lot of people know, we've been very successful at transferring technology from universities into the marketplace, and a lot of that tech transfer effort is based on patent positions and, and the estate assurance that patent positions provide. So this, this issue of the grace period, which is 
the relief valve that relieves the tension between the academic drive to publish versus the tech transfer drive to patent is a very powerful part of the American Defense Act and something that we think uh, Europe really needs to adopt also as a way to vastly increase the prospects for moving great university research um, through the twin valleys of death and into uh, um, and, and in the marketplace. So it's a great question. Uh, we've talked offline about the really precise details, but I believe the new American Vents Act is actually very well constructed in terms of the, um, the mirror image between what constitutes prior art in terms of a publication, academic or otherwise, and what gets access to the grace period in a way that's extremely uh, innovation and collaboration and university friendly. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming out this morning. Just a reminder that um, all uh, the video and audio for this event will be posted to our guys' website tomorrow if you'd like to go back and report to anything that was said or just download it to your iPod for your morning job. Uh, thank you both very much to Undersecretary of Commerce, Mr. Kapos, and Chief Executive and Comptroller General Alti for your great presentation.